heaven, one individual is missing. God the Father, the Holy Spirit, the angels that guard the access to God, the believers of all the ages, and around that, the angels in general in this massive scene. But missing from this scene is the central person of the Bible. The most important person is missing. And so John looked as we come to chapter 5. And he saw on the right hand of, of the one who sat on the throne a book written inside on the back, sealed up with seven seals. Now, when you think of a book, you're kind of talking about, you know, okay, like a, like a book like, like a Bible with, with pages. Technically, that's referred to as a codex, but that's neither here nor there. But what John was referring to as a book in the ancient world was not that. It was a scroll. And he said he saw this scroll... And it was written inside and on the back, which itself is kind of unusual for a scroll because usually you only write on one side because just of the way papyrus was put together, papyrus was made at that time. And the Bible said it was sealed up with seven seals. Now, what, what is this about? I thought I'd give you a hint. A lot of scrolls, some of them did not have seals. Now, as you read the scroll, you would break one of the seals and you would unfold the scroll. I want you to think now, if any of you have ever bought a house or property, you see a seal on that. The seal is ownership, the seal of the state. This seal is beginning to tell us what we've got here is a legal transaction that is taking place. Now get this scene. Who controls all there is? Who is the God that ultimately controls everything. Obviously the God we worship. Yahweh, the self-existent one, the Lord God. And he's got this. I've got the deed. I've got the deed to the world. I've got the deed to the earth. And we're ready to kick the usurper out. Who's the one that's come in and tried to steal the world? Who is the God of this world? Who makes this present world look so good to you? Who uses the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life to try to tempt you? Oh, but this is a great scene. Because he's getting ready to be kicked out. And I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel saying, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven, no angel. <laughs> No cherubim could ever open the book. No one on heaven, no one on earth, no king, no president, no, no human ruler is able to open. And, and no one under the earth. Satan may temporarily be the god of this world, but the usurper does not have the right to this world. He does not have the right to open the book and the seven seals. And no one was found worthy. No one. Because the person that opens, the person that God is going to give this world to, the person that is going to be the leader. I want you to stop just a moment and think of me. Or think with me. Don't think of me. That would be a bad thing to think of. But think with me. We all want a leader, don't we? We all want to put our hope in a man. I want to make a statement. In the bottom line, man is incapable of ruling himself. Just think of that. What man do we really trust to lead us? No one was found worthy. Then John said, I begin to weep greatly. He's going to cry because no one... No one's ever ruled this world right. You think of that. That's why you tell churches, don't put your hope in a man. No pastor can lead a church right. No, 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 no ruler can lead a country right. In fact, honestly, guys, we'd have to admit that without the help of God, we can't even lead our families. Now you look at some of these people, you know, you're electing, you know, say, I mean, look, look at their personal lives. Would you want
want to trust him to run anything? No one was found worthy, and I began to cry. And one of the elders, now remember, who are the elders? Who are the elders? The elders represent the believers down through the age. One of the elders said to me, stop weeping. I want you to think of that. The elders, 24 elders, represent the believers down through the ages. And as a believer, you can say to the world, and you should, do you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Then you need to be able to tell the people around you, stop crying. Stop fretting. Stop worrying. Do you ever run into somebody in the midst of a problem, and this is how you know you have a, a person that trusts God. Don't trust this person but you can trust this person in the sense that he knows to trust God or she knows to trust God. That's the kind of person, honestly, I'm looking to follow. One that knows they can't do it, but one that knows the one who can do it. That's the person you need to follow. One of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Because look, One has been found worthy. And John looked. And he saw standing between the throne, the throne of God, and the four living creatures. He is almost, in the sense, standing in some sense at, I guess it doesn't say the right hand here, but I would assume he's standing at the right hand of God. Because every time it's, it describes where he's at in terms of that scene. It is at the right hand of God. So I assume that's where he's at right now. Between the throne and the, and the four living creatures, in other words, he's as close as these angels are that guard access to God, he's even closer. A lamb standing as if slain. Now, there is a, there's a, a group of, of dichotomies here. A group of kind of opposites, okay? He's alive, and, but he was dead. He was killed, but he's alive. A lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. That, the seven horns are incredible. When you see the Antichrist rise to power, he will talk about his horns. Horns represent power. Seven horns represent what? Perfect power. Having seven horns and seven eyes. Uh, it, we pray one of the names of God, El Roy, the God who sees me. Seven eyes means, does Jesus know what you're doing? Uh, let me ask you this. That's not really the most important question is what you're doing. It may be very wrong. And that's an important question. But the deeper question is what is the motivation of your heart? If in your heart your motivation is all about you and your power, and your pleasure, and all of that, then you need to pray, as I pray all the time, thy kingdom come. Now, listen, just, when we pray thy kingdom come, there's two aspects of that that you're praying. The first aspect is kind of like we're talking about the book of Revelation, Lord Jesus come quickly, the, the closing prayer in the book of Revelation, we're praying for the Lord to come. But there's another aspect of, of praying, thy kingdom come. Who is king of your life? Jesus said the kingdom of God is at hand. Let me say this. I don't think anybody has all the end time events right. But if you know all the end times events, if you know all eschatology perfectly, and Jesus is not king of your life, it will matter very little in the end. Think of that. There'll be preachers in hell. There'll be Sunday school teachers in hell. There'll be deacons in hell. But they can even conduct church in some sense in hell. Because they knew about Jesus. But they did not know Jesus. And you won't really know him until you allow him truly to be the king of your life. And, and he begins to change things. The 777 hours of prayer, as you pray, God begins to change you. God begins to mold you because you are becoming something. You're becoming something, and what you're becoming is either in the end going to be really, really good 
or it's going to be really, really bad. You're being transformed, even if you're sitting here now. And, and let me ask you this. If you stay on the course that you're on, if you stay on the trajectory that you're on, where will you wind up in the end? Where will you wind up in the end? Now just sit back, back and think about that. Don't let anybody preach to you, but just those quiet moments when you're in prayer, say, God, if I stay on the road I'm on, if I stay on the trajectory I'm on, where am I headed? And if you open your heart to God, and if you're truly willing to allow him to convict you, he may show you there needs to be some repentance. Repent means to change direction. Don't weep. Behold the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Now, he was alive and dead, and now he's called the root of David. Over in Revelation chapter 22, it says something amazing. He is the root and descendant of David. This kind of reminds you of, of John chapter 8 and Abraham, where Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. And, and, and so look, you're not even 50 years old. It's probably, probably 30, actually, or 31 or 32 at that time. You're not even 50 years old, so how do you say you're older than Abraham? You know, Abraham is, you know, 1,500 years before this time. Let me ask you this. How can Jesus, when he's on earth, 32 years old probably at that time, actually, say before Abraham was, I am? How can he say here, I am both the descendant of David and I'm the root that precedes David. I'm both older than David and I'm the descendant of David. Clearly, we're looking at somebody that has an eternal origin. Clearly, we're looking at somebody. My, my favorite name of God is El Olam, the everlasting eternal God. He transcends time. Time is no problem. You, you know why we have time? And this, this, this is not, don't preach this gospel, but this, this is my theory, and I could well be wrong, but I want to share this real quick. The reason we have time is because we're limited and we're fallen. I want you to understand this. When we're in heaven and we have those glorified bodies, time will be no more. Think, think of the dimensionality. I'm not going to go there. That's way, way, way beyond my pay grade, and I, I'll say something that's wrong, I don't understand, but I'm telling you this right now, we do not know, eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, nor hath it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him, but it's going to be amazing. And he came, and he took the book, wow, finally, 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 a leader we can trust. Finally, one that we can truly believe in. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of the one who sat on the throne. Jesus comes and he takes out of the right hand. And, and the, the, the person that was missing from this scene is there. I want you to think of this. It was an incomplete scene until Jesus showed up. What do you think of that? And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And then worship exploded. Then worship exploded. <laughs> Many definitions of worship. But let me tell you, there'll never be worship like this worship. This is what we all look forward to. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who said, when he had taken the book, the four living creatures, look at this incredible scene. The angels that guard the access to the presence of God bow down before him, fall down prostrate. And the 24 elders fell down. Every single one, and remember again, the elders represent the believers in heaven. Many reasons for that, and we'll talk about it as time to come. They fall down. They fall down. They fall down. We'll talk about those harps later on, but I want to just concentrate on what they were holding. 
They were holding bowls full of incense. Now, let me ask you this. In your prayer life, or if you participated in the 777 hours of prayer, or even if you didn't participate in the 777 hours of prayer, I want you to think, when you pray, what happens to your prayers? What happens to your prayers? You think just, okay, I, I prayed this prayer, and it didn't get answered. Well, you know, if you pray selfishly for what you want, you know, God give me ten million ten million dollars. I'm gonna be the worst thing that ever happened to you. <laughs> you know, give me unlimited money when I'm 20 years old. That's not gonna be a good outcome. That's not gonna be a good scenario. I can promise you that. Honestly, even this age, it probably wouldn't have a good outcome. And you're very independent. Tell God and everybody else we don't need them. But that's never the way that God intended for us to live our lives. But they were holding bowls. What happens to your prayers? Your prayers are not wasted. Do you understand that? When you pray, your prayers will outlive you. I want you to think of this. We can go back to the first century martyrs. Those that, as they were being put to death for their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus, come quickly. We can go to have time. All the martyrs up into those. Do you know that more people died for Christ in the last century than all other centuries put together? Before Next week, we're coming this time of, of prayer. for. Do you realize how many people around the world right now, they can't worship like this? Honestly. I think we would be ashamed of ourselves if we had to stand before them on the day of judgment. They paid with their lives, and we, we complained about the littlest things. But those prayers, that bowl of prayers, are those who prayed for Jesus to come. And they fell down. And they said, we have prayed for this moment. All the believers of all the ages, we prayed for this moment. We prayed for this moment that Jesus would come. I'm going to ask the band to come out now as we get ready. This is a very worshipful time, though. They prayed for this moment. They prayed for this very special moment. They're praying for Jesus to come. The Bible talks about crowns, and as we look at this, you're going to see them cast their crowns before the throne. A lot to be said about that. They prayed for this moment to come. They prayed for Jesus to come. And as, as we come to this time, to the close of service, the time of the invitation, I, I just want to give you this scene. They're praying. He is taking the seven seal scroll. And what we're going to study over the next probably six months is what's going to happen. He's going to rip that first seal. And a rider on a white horse is going to come who's going to promise the world everything. But plunge the world in the most chaotic time and the most talked about time in the Bible. No time is talked about more in the Bible than this seven-year period. People might deny it, but it's the truth. And then he's going to open that second seal. rider on a red horse is to appear and that represents war and the world will be plunged into war you don't think we're headed to war in the Middle East it's been coming for a long time that's going to have global implications and then a ride, he'll pull that third
third seal, and a rider on a black horse, which represents famine. The fourth seal, a rider, an ashen horse. The King James calls it the pale horse. Clint Eastwood was involved in a movie years ago by that name. That represents death. And then he'll peel back that fifth seal. That fifth seal will represent those tribulation saints that will be saved during the time of the tribulation. They'll be saved. They will pay for it with their lives. And the sixth seal. The sixth seal represents the physical changes. The sun will be darkened. The moon turned into blood. The mountains and the islands will be removed. And the seventh seal. <laughs> a lot is said about that seventh seal. That seventh seal encompasses way too much for me to even abbreviate today. It encompasses actually 14 different events. And by the time you get to Revelation 19, I saw heaven open. See, heaven always opens for God to take action. Heaven opened when God sent his son. Heaven opened when John was called up to see what would take place. But then as heaven is open, there'll be something coming from heaven. I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. that needs to be said.